Okay, welcome back. It's time for the second hot topic. And I want to take a look at the dangers of thrombosis and uh, the means of prevention. I've been joined by... Well, I've been joined by Dr. Helen Okoye, lecturer and consultant hematologist at the University of Nigeria, Enugu. Good morning to you, Dr. Okoye. Good morning. All right, so first of all, help us understand what thrombosis means. Okay, thrombosis is a word that describes inappropriate clot formation within the vessel. The vessel can be the artery, it can be the vein. When clot forms, when blood comes together in clumps, congeals within the vessel, that can be used to describe what thrombosis is. So thrombosis is a term used to describe inappropriate clot formation, be it in the vessel, in the artery, or in the vein. All right, uh, how dangerous is this and how is it perceived in this part of the world? Well, um, you know, the normal Nigerian factor, we tend to think that some of these unexplained conditions, once it's not malaria and typhoid, they are not for Nigerians, they are not for the blacks, but it is a global problem. It occurs in everybody, no racial discrimination, and no age discrimination, no gender discrimination. So it happens in everybody. It can happen in everybody in all countries. So um, the one bad thing about it is that if it's not identified on time, it can progress to something that is fatal hmm. and can cause death instantly. Oh, wow. So how can it be identified? There are different kinds of thrombosis. When I say that, I mean the location. Mm. Like I said previously, it can occur within the arteries or within the veins. For today, maybe we should focus on thrombosis, clot within the veins, which can be termed venous thromboembolism. Venous thromboembolism is comprised of Hello. And pulmonary embolism, which occurs within the lungs. So it depends on the site of the clot that the symptoms will present. So if we have thrombosis occurring within the deep veins, like the veins of the legs, the patients may come down with pains around the calf, around the thigh, with swelling, with worms and um, there may be discoloration for the fair people, all right? But for dark-skinned people, you may not notice any discoloration. It breaks off due to anything. It could pro progress to what is called pulmonary embolism, which is a fatal condition that is responsible for most of the sudden deaths occurring in hospitalized patients. What is the difference between this thrombosis and varicose? You know, the varicose vein. Okay. Yeah. Varicose vein is more superficial and most times will not look, lead to, it doesn't lead to pulmonary embolism. It's just a local problem, but it could be a risk factor for some kind of deep clots. That's thrombosis. Again, so I would say varicose vein is benign. It's not so bad. It's a problem, but it's not the same as deep vein thrombosis. Okay, I'm, I would have to ask you again, what causes this thrombosis? And if you can just say it in, uh, in more in a layman term, so that um, ordinary people like us can fully grasp it, how does it come about? Okay, so sorry about the, if I had used long, um, big terminologies. Okay, let me break it down. Um, 
it depends if it if we are looking at arterial or venous thrombosis. But let's restrict this discussion to venous thrombosis. That's the clot forming within the veins. There are different things that could cause or predispose someone to developing clots, inappropriate clots within the veins. This could be some inherited conditions. Looking at inherited conditions, we are looking at some deficiency of some of these normal anticoagulants. The, the body has normal anticoagulants, natural anticoagulants within the blood vessels. So when you have deficiency of any of these proteins, someone may have a higher propensity to form clots. When I talk about anticoagulants, I mean anti-clots, mm. things that will prevent clot formation. So you have enough... Protein S, you have the antithrombin and so on. So if there is any problem, any reason um, someone is deficient in any of these proteins, which usually could be genetic, the person will come down with the deficiency and will have a higher risk of developing clot. Now let's look at the common, the more common ones, which are the acquired ones. A number of factors, acquired causes, can lead to thrombosis formation, inappropriate clot formation, ranging from near pulmonary disorders, inflammatory conditions, like you have a chest infection, like you have a cancer, like you are pregnant, and about six weeks after delivery, the person is at high risk of developing clots. As a woman, if you are taking oral contraceptives or any estrogen, any hormonal um, therapy, be it a man or a woman, you are at higher risk of developing clots. Then when you sit, as we are sitting, eating popcorn, watching television, in the cinema, watching movies that we enjoy watching, and you stay longer than two, three hours, you are at risk of developing clots. Long haul travels, like you're traveling from here to maybe Kaduna or any far distance, or you're flying without in between exercise, having exercise in between, you are at risk of developing clots. Then if you have trauma, surgery, um, you're receiving chemotherapy for some conditions, the person is also at risk of developing clots. Then one more last thing, which is interesting, hospital admission. Being in a hospital or whatever condition that makes you bedridden or that makes you be in bed, confined in bed for more than 48 hours, the risk of developing clots is high. And there is no age limit? No, there is no age limit. Even though it's rare um, before the age of 18 in children, it's rare. And the risk increases exponentially after the age of 40, okay? It is, the, the risk is higher in the elderly, but nobody is above having clots, so long as you have the predisposing factors. For the elderly, you can understand they are less mobile, they have con, um, infections, they have conditions um, like diabetes, hypertension, which are also risk factors. So this could multiply the, their risk and place them in a higher place when it comes to thrombosis formation. All right, you've done a very good job at explaining it to us now. I'm sure our viewers watching who didn't know what it was would now have a better understanding of what thrombosis is about. Now let's talk about how to prevent it and how to treat it. Okay, let's start with prevention because prevention is always better. First of all, I've listed a number of risk factors. Mm. Some are modifiable, some are not modifiable. You can't modify your age. If you are 80, you are 80. But if you have diabetes, you can control it. If you have uh, hypertension, you can control your hypertension. If you have a chest condition, chest inflammation, infection, you can treat it. If you are 
if you if you are going to travel on a long um, distance, like all these long haul travels, you could in between have some kind of exercises. So it depends. You have to tackle the risk that are present in the individuals. Some people may not have any apparent risk in them. Those people could, you know, benefit from good diet. Watch your weight. It helps in controlling the risk of developing clots. You watch your weight, you exercise often, you eat good food, and make it as a habit to move every two to three hours. If you are at work, if you are at home, watching your television, pressing your phone, your social media, make it a point of duty to move around every two to three hours. Then when you get to the hospital, it is your responsibility. Take charge of your health. Ask your doctor, am I at risk of developing clots? Can you risk assess me? Your doctor will, will risk assess you and know whether you have risk. And if you have risk, he knows what to do. At times, you could be placed on prophylactic therapy. That's preventive therapy, which could be in form of drugs or in form of some mechanical devices like stockings. So these are things that could help. All right. What about... Hello? Things to prevent clots. And people at risk, like cancer patients, pregnant women, people that just delivered, people that had surgery, people that have one disorder that could increase their risk of developing clots. We usually place these people on pharmacotherapeutics, um, thera or we could place them on mechanical um, devices, like the pressure stockings. We could make them, uh, put them on intermittent pneumatic pumps. All these are geared towards moving circulation, encouraging circulation within the vessels. So at no point would you have stasis, like stagnation within the vessel. Then the, the drugs in form of pills, the preventive drugs will help thin out your blood, make it not to be too sticky to you know, come together to form a clot. So if all these things fail, then you place the patient and the patient de develops clot. You now place the patient on anticoagulants. There are different kinds of anticoagulations you could place your patients on. Some are parenteral, some you can give as in injections, some you can give orally. So depending on the patient's choice and the condition the patient has, the patient, the doctor will now place the patient on the appropriate medications. Okay, what about making it a habit to take um, blood thinners, natural blood thinners like spices, um, turmeric, garlic, ginger? Does it also um, help take you off the risk zone? Does yeah, it give you some sort of insurance also, from ever having anything to do with it? Well, um, as a Nigerian, I would say um, it's part of the diet, your diet, watching your diet, eating the right things. But there are, there are no controlled um, randomized trials on those spices and how much it can offer benefits to patients, to individuals with risk of developing, with or without risk of developing clots. So there are no studies, published studies that back up such um, drugs. But I mean, we go natural, we try to take the right things at the right time, at the right quantity. These help in reducing your risk of developing clots. How prevalent is this thrombosis in Nigeria, would you say? Unfortunately, we don't have a nationwide data on the frequency of thrombosis as a nation. But there are pockets of data emanating from different populations, from different states. So within, generally, I would say um, you have the risk of thrombosis is between 2.4 to in Nigeria. But the risk can be higher 
in surgical patients, people that just came out from surgery, in medically ill patients, in pregnant women, in cancer patients, the risks are, you know, higher there. And of course, they are of different proportions. But generally, as a country, the risk ra ranges from 2.4 to 9.6 percent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Helen Okoye, for this lecture. <laughs> I think I can simply call it that, um, thrombosis and its preventions. Dr. Helen C. Okoye, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Dr. Helen C. Okoye, lecturer and consultant hematologist at the University of Nigeria, Enugu, has joined us this morning on our second hot topic to take a look at thrombosis and how to prevent it. Well, that's the package we have for you today and indeed the week, but I won't leave you without giving you a quote of the day. There is virtue in work and there is virtue in rest. Use both and overlook neither. That's from Elan Cohen. And I am Maureen Menongwe Zigui, and on behalf of the crew members, I say thank you so much for being a part of the program today and indeed the whole week. Do join us next week for another series of The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Good morning.